My name is Megan Ross and I'm studying a Bachelor of Psychology at Monash University. I was on the VC on or off psychology and today we're going to be going through some research methods, specifically different research designs. So in this video we're going to learn what is a true experiment and then we're going to go through the three experimental designs, so independent groups, repeated measures and match participants. And then we're going to go through the three non-experimental designs, so cross-sectional case studies and observational studies. So to start off, what is a true experiment? Well, these have at least one variable that is being manipulated by the researchers, so the independent variable, and a variable that is being measured, the dependent variable. Now, it is easy to assume that every independent variable in every experiment would be manipulated by the experimenters. However, it is important to consider that when we study uh, men especially mental health disorders like depression or anxiety, we can't really manipulate these because we can't give someone depression or anxiety. And if we could, it is certainly not ethical and would not pass the ethics board. So in those cases, we need to just find a sample of people who have depression and then implement our intervention rather than giving people depression because you definitely can't manipulate that ethically. So to look at our first experimental design, we have independent groups. So people are randomly allocated to different groups which experience different conditions. Now this design is also known as independent measures or between participants. Because we're looking for the difference between participants and the difference between groups. So to conduct this experiment, we start off with our population, which we then connect, collect a sample from. And then we randomly allocate the sample into two groups. So we have the experimental group or the control group. Now we can have more than one experimental condition. You can have two, three, however many just for your experiment. But just for the sake of simplicity, I'm just going to start off with our two then. So a good thing about this experiment, so starting off with the pros, it can be done in a short period of time because every person only needs to experience one condition. This also means that participant dropout, also known as participant attrition, is not a problem here because we conduct these relatively quickly and really our participants only need to come in once and there is no order effects. Now we'll go through those in the next one, but yeah, order effects are not relevant for this study design. Now the bad things, so starting off with the cons now, we need a large sample size to make sure the groups are representative of the population. So we need a relatively large sample to be able to split them off to say the control group was representative of the population and so was the experimental group, so therefore our results can be generalised. We also have less control over variables compared to other study designs, so due to the random allocation there is no certainty that both groups will be equal in participant variables. One group may be smarter than the other group and this could influence our design in ways that are unpredictable. So that's a negative. Now looking at our next study design, repeated measures. So each participant experiences the experimental and control condition. This is also known as within participants because we're looking for a difference within the participants and not between different ones. So to have a look at how it is different, so we're going to start off with our population. We're going to take our sample. Next, we're going to have the sample experience the control condition and then we're going to have them experience the experimental condition. So everyone in our sample experiences both conditions. Now you don't have to have them in the order I presented, you can do the experimental before the control condition. It just matters that everyone in that sample experiences all conditions. So a good thing about this experiment is that it eliminates participant differences. So since every participant experiences every condition, we don't have to worry about the differences between them. We can also work with a smaller number of participants compared to independent measures. Since we're not splitting them off into two conditions, we can just work with one representative sample. A con, however, is that we have what we call order effects. Now, I mentioned these before, but let's actually digest what this means. So this is where the dependent variable is influenced by the order of the conditions rather than the independent variable. Now, a great example of this is if we're testing something like drunk driving and they're doing like a racing simulator, right? So the first time they do it, they may suck on it, but the second time they may be better. And this may not be due to our experimental condition. It may be due to experience. You know, the second time they may know the course, they may know how to use the simulator better. So the difference in their performance is due to order effects and experience rather than the independent variable. So to take this out of our experiment, we do counterbalancing. So participants experience the conditions in different orders to counteract the order effects. So in this case, we would split our sample into two groups. One group would do the control condition first and the other one would do the experimental condition first and then you would switch them. So still everyone in the sample experiences both conditions but you're just switching around the order and that'll help to negate some of that um, order effect. Another thing we do have to worry about is participant attrition. So participant dropout is quite likely in these um, experiments because 
people have to keep coming back and it's quite a long process because they have to, well, in this case, they have to experience two conditions, but sometimes it could be two or three. So they have to keep coming back and participants may not want to do that. So you can get participant dropout. The final experimental design we're going to look at is match participants. So this is when a participant in one condition matches a participant in another condition on one or more participant variables. So in this case, we start off with our population. We take a sample. And now in this case, we're going to pair up our participants together and put one in the experimental group and one in the control group. So we may pair them up on participant variables such as age and gender. So maybe we have one 36-year-old male in the experimental group and one 36-year-old male in the control group. And, you know, we have a 14-year-old girl in the experimental group and a 14-year-old girl in the control group. You can also do this with intelligence, so pair up people with similar IQs, similar life experience. We can really do anything. So let's start off with the pros of these experimental designs. So it helps the control confounding variables as it is equivalent across groups. If intelligence was a relevant confounding variable, we would help to eliminate that because we would make sure that the experimental and control group both had similar um, intelligence levels. Participant attrition is also not a problem in this design because each participant is only experiencing one of the conditions, they're not doing both. Now to look at the cons of this, it is time consuming and it does require a lot of pre-testing. You know, we have to get them to sit an IQ test, we have to get them to fill out a detailed questionnaire, um, and it is time consuming to sit there and it to match them up and it can be quite costly. It is also impossible to match on every participant variable. We are unique as humans and no two people are alike. May match on certain characteristics, but they certainly won't match on every characteristic. People have different life experiences and this can also be an influencing factor that we really can't tell how it will affect our experiment. It is also hard to have large sample sizes. Because we're looking for people that pair up, we do have to take what we get. It is impossible to be able to match everyone with a partner. So we do have to turn some people away. And due to how time consuming and costly it is, the larger the sample size, the more we have to spend, the more pre-testing we have to do. It's just very time consuming. So now moving on to our non-experimental designs, let's look at cross-sectional. So this compares different groups of participants on one or more variables at one point in time. Now this is not a real experiment because we are not manipulating it. We are just testing at one point in time. We're taking what we can get essentially. We can use an independent group design, however, we just won't have that random allocation. This is also known as quasi-experimental because we're not manipulating the variable. So we also do quasi-experiments for stuff like depression and anxiety because we're not truly manipulating that independent variable. Now to have a look, we start off with our population, we take a sample, and then we just measure the dv, um, which is the dependent variable. Now we can take multiple samples, so like we can take a sample of 15-year-olds, we can take a sample of 30 year olds and we can have two groups in that sense and measure the DV in both groups. However, we're not manipulating them in any way. We're just kind of taking our samples to so-called measure our independent variables. So like we'll take a, a sample of people with depression and we'll take a sample of people who don't have depression and compare them, but um, we're not manipulating it. So it's not a true experiment. Now, the good things is we can study how a variable changes as a person ages without following them. So in this sense, we can take, as I said before, we can take a sample of people who are 30 and a sample of people who are 15 and see how the dependent variable changes in those two age groups. So that would be in contrast into just studying 15-year-olds and then following until they're 30. So that would help to take away some of the costs and time consuming. And as I mentioned, it allows for experiments that would otherwise be unethical. So if we're studying people with depression, we certainly can't give people depression. Um, so we would use something like a cross-sectional study design. A con, however is we can only establish correlation, not causation. There we can't establish a cause and effect relationship since we're not manipulating it. Our measurement could be due to multiple factors. So we can say that our intervention is correlated with lesser depression scores, but we can't say it causes it just because we can't manipulate it directly. Results can also be caused by a third variable. So since we're only cause, um, doing this experiment in one point in time, we can't rule out that other factors are influenced. One of the best studies that show this is saying that drinking coffee leads to lung cancer. It doesn't, right? However, people who drink coffee are more likely to smoke, which then leads to lung cancer. So we can see that there is a correlation between coffee and lung cancer, but there's not a cause and effect relationship because there is a third variable involved. So when we're doing cross-sectional designs, we need to keep that in the back of our head that there could be a third variable influencing our results.
And then we also have what we might call cohort effects. So this is when people born at different times are influenced by certain events in their lifetime. So millennials, for example, experienced the recession in 2008 when people who were born after 2008 would never have experienced that. So we would call that a cohort effect because that specific cohort of people is influenced by that one specific event. Next, we have observational studies. So this is collecting data by carefully watching and recording behavior as it occurs. So data collection can be structured, unstructured, or semi-structured. So, you know, we could sit there with a checklist. We might just write down what we see. Or we might have a semi-structure, you know, when you're filling out a table kind of thing. We also have naturalistic observation. So if you use the behavior in nature or in a real-life environment, you know, you sit out the front of the coffee shop and you write down the behavior of people who walk past kind of thing. We also have what we call a contrived environment. So this is the use of an artificial environment. So you make up a fake classroom and you put a kid in it and you watch them through a two-way mirror. So that would be an artificial environment. Looking at the pros of this study design, naturalistic observation is not influenced by perceptions. So people aren't acting in the way that they think we want them to. They're acting in the way they normally do. And we can also explore circumstances that would otherwise be unethical. So if there's a catastrophic event, for example, and we're seeing how people react to an earthquake, we certainly can't make an earthquake happen. That would be kind of unethical. But if an earthquake does happen and we just do naturalistic observation and see how people react after the event, that would be okay. The cons, however, it can take a lot of waiting because you can't push people to, like, for example, you can't push two people in together and say fall in love, for example. It can take a bit of waiting for these behaviours to happen, especially the ones that are of interest to us. There are ethical concerns with observational studies because sometimes we would watch people, especially in naturalistic observation, that haven't consented to be studies. So there are some ethical concerns there. Another problem we have with these is it is difficult to determine the causes of behaviour. There are many factors that influence behaviour and it is hard to pinpoint what is causing what. And our final one we have is observer bias. So the observer may influence the results. Maybe they write down only what they think they want to see. They might not acknowledge stuff that is important, but they just don't think it is at the time. So the observer can quite influence the results. Confirmation bias, for example, where we're just seeing things that confirm the point of view we already have. So it is important to consider that maybe the researcher is influencing the results in a way.